we have to show more images of black people being trusted yeah. because the re if you don't show images of the world trusting black people, then you live in a world where credit scores will say that 54% of us can't be trusted to own a home and believe it. We've been living in a world for the last two decades. They've been saying that the majority of us shouldn't be trusted and people are like, well, maybe they shouldn't. Yeah. Because that's what they've been seeing. Welcome to Vault Empowers Talk. So we don't just scratch the surface. We dive deep into the lives of some of the world's most influential change makers. And today is no different. I'm your host, Brandi Harvey. But before I introduce my guest for today, I need you to hit that subscribe button so you do not miss any daily dose of inspiration and motivation. But without further ado, I have the pleasure of sitting down with the wonderful, incomparable Ashley D. Bell. Ashley Bell is the co-founder and general counsel for the Black Bank Foundation and the $250 million Black Bank Fund, where he facilitated the largest minority bank and CDF ideal in sports history. As the former White House policy advisor for entrepreneurship and innovation, Bell was instrumental in the Paycheck Protection Program during the pandemic. As the founder and CEO of Ready Life, a fintech platform, Ashley is shifting the mindset of advocacy to innovation by providing solutions to positively impact economic justice. Ashley believes that credit is like water and every community has to have it in order to grow. Bought Empowers Talks. Welcome trailblazer, Ashley D. Bell to the show. What's up, Ashley? What's going on? Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited. I ain't seen you since the pool party. I know. <laughs> we end up in beautiful places every time we're together. So we're always in beautiful places That's with right. beautiful people, and today is no different. Absolutely. So excited. You don't do many sit-down interviews. I don't. So I feel very honored, you know, yeah. to sit down with you. I mean, you have quite the career quite the career. You were 27 years old and the mm. youngest county commissioner in the state of Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, when I look back on that, it's like, I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell people my community, I'm from a small town, uh, but when I tell people when I got elected, like how that happened, uh, you got to be real. It's like where reality was my mother was one of the first African-American school teachers in that area. Oh, wow. And uh, everybody knew her. She helped integrate those schools. She was well respected, and I think when people voted, they were like, "Well, if he gets out of line, we're just gonna tell his mom." Let's be real. And so I, they gave me a shot, and when they gave me a shot, um, I, I think it really gave me a chance to to understand what service under fire looks like. Yeah, because uh, you don't really get it until you get in there and you make critical decisions that affect everybody's day to day life, and it's nothing more uh, intimate than a local elected yeah. official. Yeah, local elected officials, you, you go to the grocery store. Yeah. People got words. Yeah. You know, you go to the baseball <laughs> game, football game, people have words and yeah. comments. And so you have yeah. to be 24-7 on. Yeah. And that has been my life ever since. Wow. 24-7 yeah, on. But there was this shifting mm -hmm. of your mindset that took place, not just your mom being yeah. a teacher and being yeah. involved in the community, but your father. Absolutely. Because you tell a story mm -hmm. about him being 45 years old and he having to rebuild and change his life. Yeah. You know, my parents... Um, old school you know they both met at fort valley state university HBCUs. oh wow okay um, you know back when you didn't go to hbcu because you thought you needed to you went because you had to yeah because before integration and my parents um you know met first day of school and were together until my mother passed like so they they had a very strong bond but my dad was really big on um you know on business he was a suit and tie guy you yeah know, it's like when, it was different you know seeing a man come home every day with a tie on yeah 5 30 yeah. Let's go outside and play basketball. Yeah. I can't underemphasize how important it was to have a black man in my life every day, whether it's mm -hmm. your father, your grandfather, your uncle, was somebody there yeah. to set a standard. So I, I followed him. Um, but for him, when NAFTA hit, people, if you remember NAFTA, NAFTA hit in the 90s, mm -hmm. totally redid trade in our country. A lot of stuff went overseas. My dad's job went to Mexico. So he, he came home to my mom. You know, we had a choice. We can go to Mexico with the job. Mom was like, nah, we're not going to Mexico. <laughs> So he had to make a decision. You either stay mm. where you are and try to reinvent yourself. Yeah. And I think that is what you hear with my story and everything we talk about today, that the the redemptive power of reinvention, mm. of how you can consistently be able to reinvent yourself. And my father went from being a C-suite guy, corporate guy, to his job leaving and having to delete degrees off of his resume to get an interview. 
Wow. Having to interview with people half his age to get a job. And ultimately, he decided to reinvent himself around what he felt was his passion. His passion was young people. And I grew up in a black neighborhood where far too many of the kids that looked like me ended up in juvenile detention centers. So he wanted to go there to work. But the only job he could get was as a jailer. So my dad went from making a job working for Johnson & Johnson, Fortune mm. 500, to making 10% of that. Wow. And I don't care who you are. Try to think of your life. Making 10% of what you made. I'm, I'm gone. You got to check me out, <laughs> Ashley. Because, baby, I, I right. am be below. Right, right. Exactly. Below the poverty line. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so him having to take that 10% and say, I will start over, but I'll start over investing in the future. And so all those young men that I was on the block with, playing ball with, you know, in my neighborhood, we all began to share the same father. So as they would go in and out of the system, they call my dad dad. Wow. So my dad was a father to hundreds of young black men. Um, and I saw that up close. And eventually he worked his way up to be director. And by that time is when I had to make a decision about going to law school and going to work with him. When I saw my white friends who had parents that own corporations and they come home from college and they take a job at daddy's company. Yeah. My dad didn't have that. But the two decisions he made that changed my trajectory was one, when his company shut down. And he was 45 years old, not much older than I am now. Yeah. And I said, Dad, what do I have to do to not be you right now, trying to interview every day and go through this? Like, what decision do I need to make differently? He said, well, the hardest thing I've had to do is take the keys to my company, tell everybody that I have worked with for decades, that it's over. Mm -hmm. We're shutting the company down. Um, and I mailed the keys back to Newark, New Jersey. And he said, you know, these keys got to be yours. If you don't want to be like me, you got to own where these keys go. Wow. And that sense of self-determination, being able to control your own destiny, I'll never forget that moment. And so when I had the opportunity to take my first legal job, I could have worked at any big white shoe law firm, and I did that later. Worked at the biggest law firm in the world. Yeah. I have done any of that. But my first legal job was to go work with him, to go back to the jail, to go yeah. back to the detention center. As a public defender. Public defender. Yeah. Yeah. And that changed your life. It did, because... It helped me, and you'll see this at every phase of my life, it helped me understand that our systems work, just not for everybody. Yeah. Our systems were intended to have justice for everybody, but they just don't. And yeah. we can't sit back and just wait on them to some kind of way on their own correct themselves. Yeah. Um, we have to be involved. We have to be engaged. And what I saw was a system that was putting too many I mean, I'm st I was still young at the time. I'm mid-20s. Yeah. Too many little, the, the little brothers and guys I went to high school with Locked behind bars. Yeah. And I realized that I was a better lawyer because my dad knew every detail of every kid in that detention center. Wow. So when I went to court, I wasn't looking at the discovery or the paperwork that the DA was giving me telling me what my client did. I was talking to my dad about what happened on the block. My dad wow. was giving me the background. Like, look, this is what really happened. This brother was acting up at school because his grandmother just died two weeks before. Wow. He really was just trying to get attention. Wow. He really needs somebody to talk to him about grief. And he's trying to get out of his situation. And, but nobody's putting that in the police report. Yeah. They just saying he broke into some house because he left school because he wanted to just vandalize it. But really he was just looking for somewhere else to sleep. Yeah. That's the story that nobody was telling. But I could take that story into the courtroom and I could take that story understanding who this brother was or who this young sister was and give them a fair shot when I knew other public defenders didn't care. But I was empowered by that superhero black man who was my father yeah. telling me the real and I realized then that our system, it may, the systems weren't built for us, but if we lean on each other and empower each other, we can help shift the outcomes of these systems yeah. to be a little more equitable. And I think that's what I've tried to repeat time and time again with the different enterprises and things that I've done. I mean, you, you've you really lent your voice to politics because outside of you being these, this young county commissioner up in Gainesville, you also uh, were very instrumental in Mitt Romney's campaign, right? Yeah, it was 2012. It was my first time really understanding how the system was set up. It was really in Gainesville, first off, it is a system where we have probably 5% black population. Yeah, I've, on, I've only been to Gainesville a couple times. I yeah. spoke at the high school one time, yeah. What? Yeah, one of my mentees went to Gainesville oh. High School, yeah. Her name is Ashley Dabney. She is a graduate of Grambling 
State I University. Know, yeah. Uh, uh, I know. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, William Dabney, Ashley Dabney. I know all of them. Yeah. So, like, Small we, world. It was yeah. only 5% black people. We yeah. All, they might be my cousin now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was, it was, it was, it was learning from an environment in Gainesville where it was really like, how do we get outcomes? How do we move from a system of where we pick teams, but we, we, we pick policies instead of teams. Um, and so for me being an elected official in the middle of the greatest economic decline of my lifetime when the, when the economy yeah. exploded in yeah. 2008, 2008 yeah. 2009. That's what I came yeah. in. And so we sat down and we were like, look, how do we find a way of reorganizing government to make it work for us? And so I went to my community and I can tell you, when I sat down with black folks in the community, I said, look guys, this is what we got to do. We got to figure out how we survive this mm -hmm. and power is going to be the only way we can figure out how to do it because we're not a majority. Yeah. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to study communities that may not have more people. Like we're not a, we're never going to be the majority in this country. Never going to be the majority. So we got to figure out how do we leverage our, everything we have to influence the systems. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from that was that you got to be able to work across the aisle. Yeah. There's nothing that has ever happened in this country to benefit us or anybody that one side can do on their own. Yeah. When I learned, like my father told me, he said the civil rights movement, we never had a prescriptive outcome that we thought Democrats or Republicans were gonna give us. We had to sacrifice our bodies. We had to sacrifice our jobs, our lives many times in order to get the attention of the masses. And every piece of legislation that allows me and you to vote, have affordable health care and housing, it had to have an element of people of a partisanship. Yeah. And so once I understood that, I said, okay, it's never been about being against anybody. It's what's our goal. Yeah. And I've always focused on that. Yeah, because most people don't know you were, you identified it as a Republican at one point, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and for me, it was, well, first off, I've been both. So I know. And, and I say that not for like a yeah. choosing size. Of it. Ooh, it was a black man that's a Republican. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. doing that. Yeah. It's, but yeah. It's, it's both of... I'm the only person in this country that can say they worked at the DNC and the RNC. Yeah, yeah. I'm the only person that can say they worked for Democratic presidential candidates and Republican candidates. Yeah. The game, I've seen at a level that most people haven't on both sides. So what you see me able to do now is an expert level understanding of the field because I understand exactly how the game is played on both sides. Yeah. It's like being bilingual. It's like you can walk in to a community and be able to speak the language and understand that the words may sound different, but people are trying to say the same thing. Yeah. And so when you can see the whole field for what it is at a high level, not just because you sign up prescriptively to certain news channels or that, but I understand the inner workings of both sides. Yeah. You can't dismantle something you don't understand. You can't build a better system until you understand how the systems that are against you have always operated. Yeah. And then you really can't understand until you understand that a white power structure in America does not care about party. Yeah. <laughs> and the moment I saw that, yeah, that a white privileged power structure in this country that has marginalized communities is ambivalent of party. Hmm. It is completely structured from the core of this country to the top. Yeah. It's being a system that has been built to perpetuate the outcomes that we have. Yeah. And once I understood that, and I can see that, then this rush of enterprises that you see myself build with Dr. King and all the things I'm doing, this is a this is an understanding of the field, the whole field. Yeah. And not seeing it for bits and pieces and trying to pick teams. There's only one team. Yeah. The team is those of us who have been put on this world to protect, uplift, and empower the least, the last, and the left behind. The least, the last, and the left behind. If that is our goal, then that can be the only focus. And we can't be separated by the affiliations. We must be united by the aspirations of those who gave everything they had so we could be here today to give our best. Yeah. I love that because I think it really lends itself to what you're doing in the world of economics and economic mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. And more so economic justice. Because you are moving nothing about 
party lines with this. This is about the dollar and how it's generated and flows through our community and our country. And so you lead the Black Bank Fund and this $250 million uh, Black Bank Fund. Kind of explain to our audience what that means. You know, capitalism has been criticized. (laughs) uh, And there's a lot of good reasons that the average person could criticize capitalism because of the outcomes, because of the disparities we see in our country, especially with black and brown people. But I argue that we've never really tried capitalism. Mm. What we have is counterfeit capitalism. It is capitalism in name only, meaning that you call it capitalism, you say it's a free market, but you deny certain people access to capital. It's not a free market. If you systematically tell one group of people that you cannot have access to own a business, then it's not capitalism. You're creating a counterfeit capitalism that benefits some and hurts others. Yeah. So I believe that for us truly to see if capitalism really works, you really got to give everybody access to a truly free market. And so I'm not in a position to say that I will ever believe that the banking institutions that we have now that are not majority minority controlled will ever give us a fair shake in your lifetime or mine. Yeah. Three weeks ago before we filmed this, you had a bank in this United States that was just fined for redlining. This is 2023. Yeah. They paid a huge fine to the Department of Justice for redlining this season, this year. So for me, the only way around that, I can't legislate away racism. You can't you can't pass laws to make people like us or want to give us a shot. So we have to take a very direct approach to this. Whether you're white, black, or brown, if you truly believe that there should be equity in this country, then we should build institutions that allow us to have our own. Hmm. That's simple. So this this view that I have of understanding both sides and the systems, for me, is if black people have their own banks, then we can neutralize what white privilege is. What white privilege is, by definition, is the fact that a white person can walk into a bank and not think twice about whether or not they get a loan, whether or not they're white or not. Yeah. They're ambivalent to that question. But every black person has a sense of worry. Yeah. Anxiety. Yeah. Every time they try to get a loan, even if their credit score is good, even if they have the money in the bank, we've seen that 50% of the time it doesn't matter. Yeah. You still can get denied. So I can't erase white privilege. So what I can do is give black people the same feeling, which is if I walk into a bank and people that look like me own it. Yeah. The one thing I do know is that they won't tell me I can't get the loan because I'm black. <laughs> exactly. Now, I may have other stuff I got for <laughs> But it won't be that. Yeah. So what I've tried to focus on is how do you make capitalism work? And so the Black Bank Fund was to realize that um, the night Dr. King was assassinated, 68, there was over 140 black banks in our country. Hmm. And today, you and I sit in the world where there's only 20. Wow. So when I look at the system of how that happened under Democrat and Republican administrations, there has been a concerted, overt effort to limit access of black controlled financial institutions. Yeah. Not because I said it, because look at the numbers. From 1968 to now, we've seen a precipitous decline of black banks. And every time a black bank dies, opportunity dies. So now you're left with communities that are, as you mentioned, credit deserts. Well, the only places we can go to get access to credit, check cashing, yeah. license, title loans, title ponds. And so I've tried my best working with others like Dr. Bernice King, like uh, the, the chair of my of the Black Bank Fund is um, my dear sister, the mayor of St. Louis, uh, Tashara Jones, uh, Ryan Clark from ESPN, Hill Harper, my brother who's <laughs> running for center. Right running now, for Michigan. center, yeah. Uh, all of us have been friends and working on both sides of the aisle, understand that our problems are bigger than anything that any party can solve. Our solutions have to be bigger. (laughs) Ideology won't save us. Ideas will. Yeah. And our idea is that you must reinvest in the black banks that exist and you must create more access points to capital. Every black person in this country should not be forced to only have an option to go to a bank that might discriminate against them because of the color of their skin. That's not what Dr. King lived for, and nobody in this country would think that's the right thing to do. But 
privilege for some. When I say black bank, many people say, why has it got to be black? Why you got to have a black yeah. bank? What is that about? Why, why you got to talk like that? All I'm saying is that if you truly understand privilege, it's the fact that you don't have to think about what I'm thinking about. Yeah. That yeah. is your privilege. Yeah. You don't have to spend one moment thinking about being a different color and whether or not that color is affect affects how you live, how you feed your family, and how you chase your dreams. Yeah. So we're just trying to level the playing field. And so the Black Bank Fund was invented to just do that. And so since George Floyd, we've been able to do $1 billion of transactions through Black Banks. Oh, wow. And that is because after George Floyd, we saw a very unique moment. Uh -huh. Um and Dr. King and I, and I say Dr. King, Dr. Bernice A. King, who's my co-founder in this, um, we saw a unique moment to where you saw a lot of people make a lot of announcements after George Floyd, $50 billion of announcements of what they were going to do to support and uplift and protect black lives. Yeah. But that announcement season's over. Yeah. Now it's accountability season. And I think that our ability to be broad in our approach to government and public officials being Republican and Democrat and black and all working together allows us to hold a heavier hand of accountability to corporate America and say that, where'd that money go? And ask ourselves, hold ourselves accountable and say, did we ask for the right stuff? <laughs> because a lot of times we're sitting here looking for, what kind of grant can I get my nonprofit? Yeah. But our, the quote, Van Jones, you know, when he got that hundred million from Bezos and Van is a friend. He's on my board. Um, I'm tired of dancing for my supper. Mm. I'm tired of asking every year. Can I get some more money to help my people? Yeah. Can I, can I get another grant to help my people? We need this. We need that. Let me show you how bad I need it. Let me, let me show you all these black babies that need food. Let me show you all these schools that are crumbling. These black kids that can't read. Let me show you these black mothers that need childcare. Let me, let me just keep showing you how bad our circumstances yeah. are. Can I get a check? Yeah. If we love each other, then we can't let that happen in another generation. Yeah. If we truly believe that the death of that brother and George Floyd and every black martyr that died before him, that their blood was not shed in vain, then we must create institutions that can be the power that can make us self-reliant, that we can be self-determinative, meaning that we can have our own banks, we can have our own nonprofits, and the day you know that actually happened is the day that we go to a gala of pick any black nonprofit you want and look on the sponsorship list of who sponsored that gala. Yeah. And don't see companies that created a problem in the first place. <laughs> Cause right now we're begging the people who creates the problem to fund us. Yes. So how can you break that cycle Yeah. when you're asking the very people? That's such a great point. That's such a great point. Cause we really don't think about that. We really don't think about that. But you you made a point really uh, recently and I, and I don't want to misquote you when you said this. You said that we will look at banks in a few years the way our generation views Blockbuster. We're all on Netflix now. Yeah. Um, and and I, I say that because uh, technology, the technological gap, I mean, back in the early 2000s, we called it the digital divide. I think all of us that are Greek, I'm divine nine too, but if all of us called it the digital divide, we got to fix the digital divide. Now it's just, it's not even divide, it's a chasm. Yeah. 64% um, of black people say right now that they'll leave their bank and go to a black bank if they felt like it gave them the same service. Mm. We would leave what we're doing right now. The problem is um, our black banks have not kept up technologically. Yeah, right? yeah. So they're becoming blockbuster. Mm. Because if you try to open a black bank account right now from your phone, just try it and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no knock on them. It's yeah. just that they have been undercapitalized and ignored for so long that they don't have the capital to meet our needs uh, some are some are getting there, but the reality is, I believe that if we're going to survive the next ten years financially as a community, uh, we got to really think hard about investing in ourselves, and we got to we we got to hold each other accountable. Uh, a black bank is like every other black business. Yeah. Um, how many times you got your favorite restaurant that's black owned, and you're like, man, I can't find them over east of Georgia. Right. I gotta really right. drive over there. 
Yeah. I got to wait in that line. I got to wait in that line. Oh, they got to Keith exactly. Lee. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, but bank is no different. Yeah. Bank, bank yeah. is no different. So, so at, the, at, at the end of it for us, it is how do you have a, a, a thinking forward about what financial institutions look like? You got brothers uh, like Rodney Williams at, at, at Solo Funds. Um, you got tech giants, black tech giants everywhere. They're figuring out a way to create access to credit within our own economic ecosystem. What I envision is a world in the next five years where, you know, someone like you who's got a cousin that's probably like, you know what, Brandy, I need to hold a thousand dollars. Let me hold Her name is Lexi. There Just go, go ahead. Right. So the world we live in should work like if Lexi wants to borrow money from you, <laughs> then, you know, if y'all related, you know, you, you, we all got cousins that want something. But what should be able to happen is there should be a tech, there should be tech in place to where you can just shoot her a link and it, her link, she opens it up and says, oh, okay, so I want to borrow $1,000. Let me pick my payment plan to pay Brandy back. Oh, come on, Ashley, give so, it to me right now. So <laughs> can I pay back $100 a week? Can I pay back $250 every two weeks? Yeah. Go ahead and now she's filling it out like she does Klarna when she bought a bag. <laughs> while she's filling it out like she did shopping bag, you know? And yeah. so now you're in a situation where you can lower it a thousand and don't have to think about that awkward conversation at Thanksgiving next year when she pay you back. You got to figure out what's going to happen. You should just be able to say, boom, boom, boom. I get my money in my account every four or five months. However, she sets it up. Yeah. But at the end of the day, she's still more likely to get a loan from you and better rates from you because you can also you should also be to set your interest rate. Wow. You set your interest rate with her. Then you, you set that interest rate. Then, you know, you're getting paid back. And if she doesn't pay you back, you got receipts. Wow. Like, look, this is where we're moving to. But here's the reality. What that story is, is not just about your cousin borrowing money from you. That's about us lending to each other. Yeah. And us setting the terms for each other, not being preyed upon, but doing it with people who actually give us credit. Whereas the people that love us and who know us and who are willing to extend grace and mercy to another brother or sister in need. Mm -hmm. What our system has been missing is grace and mercy. Yeah, that is what America's financial system has never given African Americans. And if we can extend that grace and mercy to each other, then I believe that we have enough capital in our own community to start to close the racial wealth gap on our own. Yeah, but how do we become more bankable? Because we talk about this and we say that there's this digital divide in in our own banking systems, but also in our own communities. So how can Black people become more bankable? in credit, credit deserts, in places yeah. where we don't have the access? Well, it starts with, you just got, let me say this, cause this is hard, but we rightfully don't trust banks. Um, so to be bankable would assume that banks will treat us right if we act right. Hmm. It's not the case. It's never been the case. I can't, Explain, and I'm gonna explain to I explain to my white friends because I tell them all the time. They're like, "Well, actually, just go in the bank and get a loan." I say, all right, well, <laughs> like that's not been tried. <laughs> Never thought of that Never before. Thought of that before. <laughs> but but uh, the reality is, our story with banking begins with our great leader Frederick Douglass, and I tell them this because they like to highlight Frederick Douglass as one of our greats, and he is. But everybody likes to talk about Frederick Douglass just like Martin Luther King, only the the parts that they like. Yeah. The fluffy, nice, kumbaya parts of their life. They don't want to talk about what 4th of July meant to a slave. Yeah. And they also don't want to talk about the fact that the very first black bank, and this is at the core of this, there's nothing I'm talking about in banking that can escape this moment in our history. The core of this was 1874 when our Congress created the Freedmen's Bureau. And they teach it to us like it was some great thing. Like it was a Freedmen's Bureau for freed men. It was mm. the first bank. And if you ask most black people, raise your hand. And if the Freedmen's Bureau was positive, eight out of 10 will raise their hand and say it was great. It was the first bank. It was a bank for black people. But at the end of the day, the Freedmen's Bureau was America's first Ponzi scheme on black people. Yes. And it was the fact that Frederick Douglass, well, first off, every black, but every president of Freedmen's Bureau before Frederick Douglass was white. And then when the bank began to fail, they brought in Frederick Douglass to try to convince us to bank there. So watch that play. How many times has that play played out in so many different sections yeah. of our community? Yeah. Something went wrong. Go get the black guy, put yeah. him over it, and tell the black guy to tell yeah. everybody else it's all good. Yeah. How many times have we seen that play out? I mean, we just saw it in 2020. Exactly. I mean, full force. 
full yeah. force. So now you have Frederick Douglass goes into the Freedmen's Bureau, and that brother admits, I'm not a banker. <laughs> I was born a slave. Yeah. <laughs> like, literally a slave. And I, I had to educate myself, I'm not a banker. But what he did was, he took $10,000 of his own money, which is like a million dollars A million now. back then, yeah, yeah. And he took $10,000, he said, I'm just gonna deposit it in this bank and see where it goes. And he watched his $10,000 leave Washington, D.C. and end up being in speculative junk bonds on the West to build railroads and speculate for mining, all of which was fake. Yeah. And he goes back to Congress and tells Congress, and this is the critical moment because I think every black person at some point, you have to ask yourself, when you see yourself attached to systems and places and things that aren't fitting your values or your purpose, you got to have a Frederick Douglass moment. Frederick Douglass goes into Congress and says, I cannot in good conscience ask my people to put one more dime in this bank. We need to shut it down. You know how hard that is? Yeah. Something created to do the one thing that's never been done in human history was to take people that were capital, meaning that you and me were on somebody's balance sheet as capital, yeah. and tell that capital to become capitalists. Hmm. And tell them to do that, you have to be a part of a bank to do it, because this is America. And then have that bank steal your money? Steal, yeah. And with the stroke of a pen, 60% of black wealth, even though we had only been technically Americans for five years, five or six years, evaporated. Yes, yes. And what W.E.B. Du Bois said is the answer to your question to start off with. W.E.B. Du Bois said, it would have been better off for us to remain slaves another decade than to suffer the psychological harm of the government closing down our only bank and taking all of our money. Yeah. Because that is why we're not bankable. Mm -hmm. Because that passed down to your great-grandparents and yeah. my great-grandparents and us today are still a distrust in the banking system. It's being perpetuated. So how long do we have to sit here and continuously say, how can I convince this bank to do better? How many lawsuits do we have to have? Or do we build our own? Mm -hmm. And that is why Dr. King and I thought it was important to invent what we believe the next generation of black bank. And we called it redemption for that purpose. I mean, first of all, Ashley, I just want to just thank you for this history lesson you just dropped <laughs> on our audience because it does not happen often. But today has been one of those days where uh, our previous interview, Charles Blow, was also dropping the knowledge of his his argument is reverse migration of getting black people to move back to the south to Charles a brilliant brother He's yeah spot on. to bring forth black power and so even when I hear you talk about the power that we really do have in our community with our dollar I don't think that we know how to how do we leverage it you mm -hmm. know outside of a Wells Fargo or a Chase or a you know all those big name breaks how do we leverage it. Well, first off, um, I think that, you know, this is, we, it starts with jobs, right? At the end of the day, um, we have to always be worried about employment, right? Building yeah. jobs that we have skills to fill and that we are educating our children to be able to do those jobs. And far too many times we're about two generations behind and we tell our kids to get ready for jobs that are going to be gone by the time they get a degree. Hmm. We as parents, as educators, as leaders must always be thinking ahead about the jobs of the future. Uh, I think you and I talked about the super soaker deal. Yeah, right? so it's yeah. Like I, I wish I had examples like that as a kid of more black men in STEM. Yeah. And uh, it may have changed the way I see the world, what I'm doing now. But when I look at, um, you know, how do we, you know, pool our money and expand it? Here's the reality. Some people will be laborers. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong Some with people will work every day for an hourly wage. But for those of you who are trying to figure out, if you believe in your heart that you have the will, the ambition, and you're savvy enough to be an entrepreneur and to create wealth that can create jobs, you must understand that you will never get wealthy off your labor. If somebody is paying you for your time, like literally for your time, there's only so much of that. That is a finite resource. Mm -hmm. To create wealth, you have to be in the business of multiplying money. That is why credit is like water. That is why credit is so important. That's why banking is so important. Credit's the only way you can take $10 and make it 100 and do nothing. Yeah. You can leverage it. But as long as somebody's paying you $20 an hour, 
hundred fifty dollars an hour or even ten thousand dollars an hour. You ain't got but so many hours. Yeah. So we have to build businesses as we grow them, mm-hmm. the way you can sell services and be in a marketplace to where we are churning money and we're multiplying it. And the big part that we're missing is private equity, just to be real. The big part of that is that we don't have access to what creates most of the wealth in this country, and that's Wall Street. And it means how can a, a, a brother who's really smart but has an idea that needs $100,000, how can he get that $100,000 to fund his new tech idea, to fund his new delivery idea? And the, that goes to the old adage, there's more brain power in our jails hmm. than in our schools when it comes to colleges. Yeah. Sometimes. Because there's so many brothers out there that just didn't see a way, but they are brilliant on the street hustle. Yeah. And that's going to waste because we don't have a way of telling them, actually, there's a way for you to fund that idea. And private equity is the way to do it. For those who know what private equity is, this to be really simple. It's not going to a bank. Do you think the average person that built Amazon or any of these big brands you talk to walked in Wells Fargo? Or Bank of <laughs> None of them did that. Yeah. There's not one company that we look at every day and they just said, oh, I walked in a bank, got a loan, and that's how I started uh, just Spotify. Hmm. That didn't happen. <laughs> they went to people with money yeah. and said, take a risk on me. I mean, you and I both know this because our mutual friend, Melly McCloskey, who was on the show, I mean, she did not go to a bank. She had investors. She had friends who she went to. To now, she is a little different because she is not. You know, she ain't. She ain't. She in the culture though, y'all. She, she, we love that. <laughs> we love that. But that she talked about that of uh, being able to leverage that. But for the person, Ashley, who does not have, you know, friends who are starting Spotify and Instagram, right. who jacked up their credit, who had a light bill in their name when they was eight, you know, who have no idea what to do with it. Um, What do you tell that person of how they can even, what's the first step in establishing credit or even finding your way through private equity? First off, um, I want to say that the credit system as it is, for everybody out there who's a, who I think, there was a couple of research polls that came out that showed that our credit scoring system is one of the top reasons that black um, millennials have anxiety and mental health issues. Mm. Um, people feeling ashamed of these three digits that these three companies give us. I want to say to them that um, don't believe it. You're more than a credit score. And those credit scores are fundamentally institutionalized racism. Wow. Because if you look at our credit reporting agencies, at 54% of black people on those credit agencies are deemed untrustworthy to own a home. How can we live in a world where we could possibly fathom the fact that half of us shouldn't be trusted to live in a home that we own? Wow. I reject it. I think every black person should reject it and know that that system and that algorithm was not built for us. It was meant to contain, confine, and marginalize us, which is what it has done. Yeah. So as long as we continue to believe in that construct, that I'm frustrated by this 600 to 610 credit score because it's telling me that I gotta pay $3,000 a month in rent when my friends live in a house paying $2,500 a month in a mortgage, and they're yeah. like, it, that makes no sense. Yeah. So. What we've been focused on, what Dr. King and I have been focused on is in trying to create a different system. Like, I know I can't get rid of that system. And we know if you listen to this, that well, that's the system we have. That is a system that we have, but we need a new system. This is where innovation comes in. This is why we're leveraging private equity with our company Ready Life to create a system where you can get access to a home without a credit score. That all you really need is income. Because I fundamentally believe if you're paying $3,000 a month for rent, why wouldn't you pay $3,000 a month for a mortgage? Right. If it's the same price. Right. Why should I have to ask these credit bureaus if you will continue to pay the same price or less? There's better ways of determining if somebody is credit worthy to own a home. And the fundamental part of creating assets and creating wealth in our country is owning a home. That is the American dream. That is the rock cornerstone of creating wealth in our country. So if we can't own where we live, then we can't control where our kids go to school. Yeah. What's the fundamental way that we fund our education? Through property taxes. Yeah, through taxes. Yeah. So if they won't let us own a home 
and the home is how we pay taxes, <laughs> and that's what funds our schools. And then we're stuck trying to figure out why this guy won't teach black education in schools in Florida. Yeah. That's yeah. what we're stuck with. Yeah. That we sit here trying to figure out as the only race of people, we're upset because somebody's telling us that we can't get, our kids can't get educated on our history. Empowerment begins with home ownership because what that does for us is we control, we, our tax dollars can be more influential on education. It'll help us out democratically in the little d, meaning that people would be more inclined to vote when they got more skin in the game. Exactly. You know how much stuff you care about when she own a home? You care Listen, about <laughs> Ashley, you met my mama now. Yeah, that's right. Ashley, now this that's lady right. will write a letter about a pothole in a minute, okay? That's what home ownership she, does. she will be down at the city. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. All those things are affected. So when we talk about our friend Melody, who I love to death, and Charlie is my brother, um, I will say this, that you know I've been fortunate to have great friends like them, like you have, Yeah. who will open those doors because the reality is the private equity game is a small groups of people who bet on each other. Yes. That's really all it is. Yeah. It's people with money betting on other people with money who got good ideas. It's that simple. So the question is, I will always give this critique, and this is why I feel like sports is so important, entertainment is so important, which is why the Black Bank Fund, we've done most of our deals through big sports, is sports have been a generator for a lot of creating black wealth. You know, millionaires all over the place. They may not be millionaires long, but they at least made that for a little bit. And I think that if we really had a conversation about asking our athletes and our entertainers, how many black businesses have you invested in that you don't own, but you took a risk on somebody else? How much of your time have you spent not trying to get an endorsement deal to put your name on somebody else's company, but empowering a young sister or young brother to have the resources to expand their company? Think about what one of our influencers could do if they put their name on an up and coming black tech company, yeah, up and coming black trucking company. Yeah. They extended their social power and influence to them, yeah, versus a soft drink, yeah. What's that soft drink doing for us? <laughs> give it us the sugar. <laughs> give it us the sugar. <laughs> <laughs> we we have to figure out a way to 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 better leverage. So with private equity, it, it is it is how do you get into it? I mean, all of us that have, I hate to say this, what you're talking about, Robert Smith, myself, or you, anybody, there's somebody that don't look like us. Yeah. Had to crack open a door and say, here's your shot. But for all of us that have made it in the door, it is our obligation to not leave the door cracked, but to remove the hinges. Mm. If you are not trying to unhinge that door every day that you're in there, then we are literally letting the blood of those martyrs be wasted in vain for every one of them, whether it was George Floyd back, because you got to believe all that hype after George Floyd's murder, it's about gone. Yeah. The hour, the sand in that hourglass is, is going out. And the cause and the, and the popularity of black lives in our country will ebb and flow according to the popularity of the last person that got killed on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah. So yeah. now that we're going into this piece where we haven't had somebody die recently on Instagram that took the consciousness of America, um, then we're not seeing the support. It's drying up. And now you're seeing the total opposite. Think about all the black women that got jobs as head of DEIs across our country yeah. in the last three years that are now under attack. They can tell you that jobs are living hell because they live in organizations now that once celebrated them two months after George Floyd. Now they're trying to figure out whether they belong in HR or they yeah. need to be somewhere down the hall or outside. Yeah. And nowhere when you're connected to the business. This is how our country works. Yeah. And the only way we can get around that is we have to leverage those that are allies. We can't do it on our own. Let's be real. We cannot do it on our own. It's going to take an allyship of people of all races, creeds, and backgrounds to be able to say, let's invest our equity wisely and in things that are sustainable, institutional, and can create wealth in multitude. Yeah. I really want you to stay on the sports thing because okay. you did this unprecedented deal with the Emory Sports Complex, $35 million, and then the NFL, $78 million. So I yeah. want you to talk about yeah. why those were unprecedented, biggest deals in history. Yeah. So the deal, um, the first time in sports history that a black group of investors and banks, uh, let me start over. Let me say this a different way. Um, so your question about the 
those two deals, right? The first one was here in Atlanta with the Atlanta Hawks. Let me set the stage for that because the reality was that happened right after George Floyd. Mm. So right after George Floyd, you got an owner like Tony Ressler who owns the Hawks, who we all know in Atlanta was replacing an ownership team that was racist, right? And I think you got about, what, every two years, some NBA owner loses their team for being racist. Well, it's, about, it's a right. cycle, right? But right. that was our year. Right. You know, we, we lost our owner. And Tony comes in, and he's honestly, you know, uh, took some good advice. And I think, you know, you look at Dr. King, my business partner, who was able to take the ATL off the jerseys and put MLK. Yeah. For the first time for the for for any That's any right. NBA team. That's right. Yeah. And those proceeds go to the King Center yeah. for nonviolence. You saw for the first time uh during COVID when when everybody's outside trying to sweat and vote, State Farm Arena became the largest voting precinct in the country. Yeah. That's Tony Ressler. That's our Hawks. So you had an owner that was willing to walk into the moment. And not because he had all those ideas on his own, but he surrounded himself with really smart people, black and white and otherwise, right? But I think that um, the moment for me, and you met my son, uh, it was with my son. My son and I were um, marching downtown Atlanta after George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was a C-suite march. So a C-suite march means a lot of white folks who are C-suite and it happened about 9 a.m. It's not going to be... <laughs> And they have to do it. It's going to be early. First of all, this is my first time hearing about C-Suite March in Ashland. That's why. It was early. It was over with by 11.30 a.m. Everybody's back home. But, but it was important. It was important. Uh, so we had, you know, execs with us. And I uh, I get to the march. And I'm actually marching with uh, my son and then the CFO of the Hawks. So the CFO of the Hawks is marching with me. And I have my son with me. And my son has been to every MLK march with me his whole life. He knows what to do. He gets his board. He knows to write down what he wants to say. We march, you know. But Thad is white. He's from Youngstown, Ohio. His kids, you know, it's their first march. Yeah. So he's like showing them what to write. You know, they're working together on this stuff. And it was one of those moments where Thad and I are marching. We're talking about, you know, he's like, I've never done a march before. Where do we go? I'm saying, <laughs> you know, we, just, we fall. It was, so, it was so much going on that morning. And our kids are in front of us. They're 13, 12 at the time, probably talking about Fortnite, but they're holding up their signs. They're yeah. doing that thing. But the reality was that that is a CFO of a billion dollar corporation. And by the end of that march, he said to me, he said, I'm worried about what I tell my son when this march is over. Mm -hmm. How do I explain what we did today? Yeah. How do I say I did more than get exercise? Mm -hmm. And I said, Thad, you're thinking the right way. Because this moment in time, yes, we're walking in the midst of history. Down streets like Ralph Abernathy Boulevard, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Andrew Young International Boulevard. These are the names of icons that broke the back of Jim Crow. Yeah. But in this moment, you're sitting in the seats where the men who they had to work with some 65 years ago were CFOs just like you. But you had to see the world differently after this moment. And yeah. dad said, Ashley, show me how. Help me figure this out. I said, Dad, go to work tomorrow, do exactly what you do, but do it differently with different people. Mm -hmm. And we ended up looking at the Atlanta Hawks Arena, Sports Arena in Brookhaven. And he said, I would love to try to figure out how to get black people involved. I said, Dad, if you want to really go for it, I think black people could finance this whole deal. Wow. And he said, I have no idea how that would happen. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, and I said, you know, myself, Brandon Comer, we got together with Dr. King. And long story short, that became the first sporting arena in American history, 100% financed by black people. Wow. Top to bottom. It took 11 black banks from across our country, banding our resources together to show the world what we could do if we all band together. Yeah. That we could finance that deal just as good as J.P. Morgan or Bank of America or Wells Fargo could have done. Yeah. And we did it. And it didn't cost the Hawks a dime. But what it did do is that the profits that those banks made from that deal turns into black home loans, back black business loans when they can't get a loan from other people, loans for our churches when that building fund is trying to find the right bank that'll work yeah, with us. It's our yeah. black banks that work with us. Yeah. So all of that happened because of that deal. And because of that, it became a blueprint that two years later, the NFL, Roger Goodell and the commissioner's uh, office wanted to see if that would work with the NFL. Uh, and we did it with Major League Soccer. But the NFL deal was unique because that was the biggest. Yeah. But we had to prove ourselves. So $78 million. That was the biggest. But we had to prove ourselves in Atlanta first. And this is why it is true that Atlanta influences everything. Yeah. 
that deal couldn't have happened if it wasn't on the streets of Ralph Abernathy Boulevard with the CFOs of our companies marching with civil rights leaders and business leaders on our streets with our kids, looking at them as the future, knowing that we had to answer to them in 10, 20 years from now and say what we did when George Floyd was murdered. Yeah. What was the meaning of the marches? Yeah. And we look back on that and we'll be able to say we proved to the world that they gave us a shot, that black businesses, whether it's a bank, whether it's a food truck, whether it's a tech company or a marketing company, but when we put our minds to it and you give us a shot, we can operate and execute the level of anybody. Absolutely. And we proved that. I got chills when you were telling that story. I mean, totally. Because I think that, one, people really don't know. This is not making mainstream headline news everywhere. This is something that we should be seeing across the shade room and all these platforms that we highlight all these other things that happen in our community, right? But and highlight we, things that we shouldn't be highlighting. Exactly, right? So we're not we're not even aware right. that these type of deals are being done, let alone that black banks are funding them. And that's because too much of our economy and too much of social media is funded off of black trauma. Mm. It's too profitable to it's too profitable to make money off of black trauma right now. When we're down, when we're at our worst, yes. when we're accused of the worst, when we yes. sometimes maybe have done the worst, yes. there's too many people who want to profit off of it. When we have to create a community of success and where we can profit off of each other's success, let's tell that story. And so when, I, when we try to do these deals and what you will see Dr. King and I focus on, especially with this bank that we're building, um, is that you have to not just bring together the right people you got to do it better than other people. Yeah. And how many times has every black parent told that child, you got to be smarter. You got to be gotta better, better than the best just to be average. Be yeah. And I think that is what we have to hold ourselves accountable for. In a post George Floyd world, we have seen a lot of money go to waste, but we cannot let the good ideas go to waste. Yeah. If you have an idea out there that you have in your heart, I ask that everybody who, if you wake up every day and you pray that your ideas find a way to light, Find your tribe. Yeah. Whether you're in Cleveland or Atlanta or LA, there are brothers and sisters out there who are willing to take the hinges off that door. Mm -hmm. And I think that for all of you that are in the process of working to take those hinges off, you got to make sure that you just can't take them off and hope somebody walks through. Yeah. Go get that brother or sister who you know needs to come through that door. Because you know what? We don't even know that that door has no lock now. <laughs> That's the issue. Yeah. Even when you yeah. do it. Yeah, absolutely. And so we can't get all comfortable as black folks saying we made it. We sit back in nice, comfortable spaces and have a good time and be like, well, we're here. Yeah. Because there's people out there who don't have the means, but have the ideas. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I think is the biggest gap we have in creating wealth in our country, a way for the best ideas to be tested, to be funded, and to be scaled. Yeah. Not only are you focused on sports, mm -hmm. you are now, you know, casting your net into entertainment with Dr. Bernice King. And you all are really focusing on creating entertainment, television, movies that have a social justice thing to them. Yeah. Um, and so Red Entertainment, we just became the largest shareholder in P3 Media. We made an acquisition, a multi-million dollar acquisition um, of on brand. Uh, a, a white media company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. So <laughs> it's, um, yeah. um, we, we bought a white bank, we buy a white media company. And, and for us, it was because um, the one thing that is so powerful, I think is overlooked um, is that we have to have the ability to control our narrative. Yes. Yes. When you think of so much harm that has happened to every marginalized community, every stereotype, Every negative thing that someone thinks about black people, Asian women, Hispanic people, whatever it is, Hollywood is screaming it from the rafters. Yeah. It is distributing it and getting paid and exploits those stereotypes. When you think of just some of the greatest movies of our time, when you think about there's there's one or two liners that have been so derogatory towards women of all races yeah. that people don't even know where the movies came from. They just know the derogatory line and that has perpetuated harm and has hurt and ki have people killed yeah. because they believe this stuff. Yeah. If you don't control the narrative, you have a hard time controlling anything. Yeah. And so we fundamentally believe that I can't trust Hollywood to tell my story. And I can't just trust us to say, well, we're going to make, we're just going to make movies that are black and we'll just show ourselves to ourselves. 
and then white people watch it and laugh sometimes. Not a tubi. You don't want a tubi. No, I don't want a tubi. <laughs> don't want a tubi. But I think I think the biggest the biggest thing for us is how do we go big? And so we were able to convince. Uh, you know, we have a feature film that we'll be re- bringing out. We we convinced people like Terry Rossio. Terry Rossio is one of the largest, the best writers in Hollywood. He wrote Aladdin, wrote Men in Black. Mm-hmm. He wrote every Pirates of the Caribbean. But convincing Terry Rossio to work with a black director and a black team to do something right down the middle that the mainstream of America will watch, yeah, but create a theme around black excellence, well, yeah, where black people can be superheroes without wearing a cape or a cat suit or how to, you know, fight an alien to be popular. Right. Right. You know, how about just right. save the world in a real way? Yeah, you yeah. know, because yeah. we're smart. Yeah, because we know what we're doing. Because people trust and believe us. We have to show more images of black people being trusted. Yeah. Because the re- if you don't show images of the world trusting black people, then you live in a world where credit scores will say that 54% of us can't be trusted to own a home and believe it. Wow. You believe it. We've been living in a world for the last two decades. They've been saying that the majority of us shouldn't be trusted. And people are like, well, maybe they shouldn't. Yeah. Because that's what they've been seeing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they've been saying. Such a great point. Yeah. So all of this ties together. Yeah. You change the narrative. You put black people in a trusted position and you show the humanity in all of us, but you show that excellence. And that is how you start changing the way America sees us. And then you will care about our lives. When you see us as the beautiful, talented, powerful, impassioned, brilliant beings that we are. Yeah. But we can't wait on somebody else to show us that. Yeah. We have to do that ourselves. And we have to do it in a way that other people see it. Far too many times we're like, well, as long as we see it, we're good. Or maybe we'll just do it in a comedy. But every aspect of media should feel us, yeah. should see us at our best. Ugh, Ashley, Ashley, <laughs> listen, I was, I don't know what my expectation was for this conversation uh, in doing the research on you. And I know that you are phenomenal and the career that you have had, but I think what I get to hear is your passion and a true commitment to excellence. And I think it's seen in just how you carry yourself and all the things that you've been able to touch. But I think when you hear the passion and the drive and the determination that you express, I mean, I am literally blown today. So I am so so excited, so excited. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm fortunate and blessed uh, to have good friends, good company. Uh, We've talked about Dr. King a couple of times. Um, there are sisters like her and you that have empowered brothers like me to be in spaces like this. Um, we owe all of you a great, a great debt of gratitude. I think every black man should spend every day pointing to the three or four black women that have allowed them to have a voice. Yeah. And yeah. thank you because you yeah. do that for so many of us. Yeah. I am so excited. You, I mean, there's so much that we could talk about. Our time is wrapping up, but as you leave from us, I want you to leave us with a word that you're committed to for this season, because I know that you are doing everything with excellence and you're focused on economic justice and removing credit deserts and making black people more bankable, but also they see us as trustworthy. What's the one word that you're committed to for this season of your life? Redemption. Mm. I think um, it is the, the process of redemption. Um, we wake up every day trying to redeem somebody or something. There's a people somewhere, a group of people somewhere that we all wake up trying to fight for. Um, they deserve to be given back everything that was taken from them. And sometimes that's hard um, to even conceive that that's possible. Yeah. But we serve a good God. And we serve a God that is uh, sits on high and looks down low. Uh, the great redeemer. And as long as we all have faith that um, every day gives us a second chance. So no matter what happened yesterday, no matter what happened to us 10 years ago, 100 years ago, from our enslavement to our captivity to Jim Crow to today, we're still trying to figure out if our lives will ever matter to those that don't look like us. Uh, we are worthy. This country is worthy of redemption. And everybody that we see every day, if you look into their eyes and you see the humanity in them and you know that there's God in everybody. Everything you do is worth it. Hmm. You have touched my heart today. Gee. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Brent. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you so much. 
you guys, that wraps up. I got tears in my eyes. I don't, I don't think Ashley knew he was coming to <laughs> give us a benediction. Amen. Look past the plate. Past the plate. <laughs> he good. didn't know he was coming to, to drop a word on us. But I am so grateful for this conversation that we have redemptive power in each and every one of our lives. So we're still worthy that we do serve a God that sits high and looks low. And I'm so grateful for the conversations that we get to have at Law and Powers Talks. You guys, thank you for joining us for another captivating conversation. Thank you to my guest, Ashley D. Bell, for this wonderful, moving, and enlightening conversation. Be sure to share this conversation with someone. Like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time here at Vault Empowers. Eat well, give a damn, move your body every day. Peace.